How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hello and welcome to DNA Today. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world, shows packed with news stories, lessons, interviews, all to keep you updated and educated on the ever-changing world of genetics. And you can tune in every Monday at 11.30 a.m. to hear me live on whus.org. Or if you're in the stores, Connecticut area, you can tune in to 91.7 FM on the radio. You can also listen to all episodes previously, including this one, on dnapodcast.com. That's where everything is put, including other lessons and little debates and uh, extra stuff that doesn't make it live on air. So what I'm focusing on today is this article that Rebecca Sklu recently published the last couple days, and she's calling the public to really pay attention to research and the public's permission in terms of researching on samples from their own bodies. And a little while back, the author of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Rebecca Skloot, visited UConn to share her journey of learning and discovering who Henrietta Lacks was, along with her youngest daughter, Deborah, who joined her on this journey, um, which she turned into a national bestseller book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, Also accompanying her were two descendants of Henrietta Lacks, Kimberly Lacks and Veronica Spencer, who joined me on the program last September when all of this took place. They shared stories of the family and different events and honors they've received um, from all that has come from HeLa cells. And you can listen to this interview and a recap of this event at dnapodcast.com. That was back in September of 2015. And Rebecca Skloot has been featured on numerous television shows, including CBS, Sunday Morning, The Colbert Report, Fox Business News, lots others, and The Immortal Life was chosen as the best book of uh, 2010 by more than 60 media outlets, including Entertainment Weekly, USA Today, Oh, The Oprah Magazine, LA Times, National Public Radio, People Magazine, I could go on and on, and another honor is that it was named the best book of 2010 and one of the best 100 books to read in a lifetime by Amazon.com. So to say the least, it's a really good book, um, and I read it uh, previous to college, and then it's come up in multiple of my courses. And it really is not just for people that are really interested in scientific research, but really the general public, because Rebecca Sklute has a really, really amazing talent of taking scientific information and watering it down so that the general public can digest the information, but they're still getting the information. She has a really great ability to um, kind of interpret this language to the lay public. Um, kind of like how I try to do on this show, but she's a total professional at doing this. So to close out 2015, Rebecca Skloot published this new article on December 30th um, in the New York Times titled, Your Cells, Their Research, Your Permission. And she's been posting on social media that she's been working on this, Instagram, Facebook. Um, she's like, you know, it's in the works, something's about to come and everything, and now it's hit the press. So her first main point in this article is that tissues from millions of Americans are used in research without their knowledge. And that's a direct quote from her. And that's what I'm talking about today on on this episode, is that, again, tissues from millions of Americans are used in research without their knowledge. That when you have um, certain procedures or blood taken, things that aren't um, the extra that's not used um, for your personal benefit of uh, certain tests and things that... Uh, the samples may be used for, the rest of it, the extra, is used for scientific research most of the time. And the general public may not know this. Um, And Sklut's point is that she wants the public to know that this is happening and for them to have a say in this. So Sklut sets the scene with a professor at Des Moines University, Jeffrey Gray, who is instructing students to unlock their phones. So you take your iPhone out, put the passcode in, you unlock it, then you pass it to the person behind you. And you're like, wait, that's crazy. Like, I'm not going to unlock all the information on my phone and they can have access to all of that. So why would someone unlock so much personal information and hand it off to a stranger with consent? Why would they do that? Well, Jeffrey Gray asked the class to imagine the phones are cells from their bodies containing all the genetic information in one's body because any cell in your body has all of your DNA in it. And he poses to the class a question. 
Do you want scientists to be able to have full access to this information without your consent? Because that's exactly what they're doing right now. So again, tissues from millions of Americans are being used in research without their knowledge. A lot of times you'll sign things that you don't read, the fine print or all of it, and we've all been guilty of doing that because you're in the doctor's office, they want you to fill something out before you go and see the doctor. And a lot of times, especially when you have a procedure or something or blood taken, you sign something that says, I give rights that they can do research with whatever extra. But that's not blatantly stated. It's usually in kind of confusing language and you really don't have time to be analyzing this before your appointment. So how do they receive these samples to research? I've kind of mentioned this, but these samples are called, quote, clinical biospecimens. This is the term that's used. And they're leftovers from blood tests, biopsies, and surgeries. With identity removed, and it's not required by scientists to have permission by the owners to use these clinical specimens. And people question, can we actually de-identify samples? Since DNA is part of this specimen, the answer is no. You can't de-identify a specimen because you're person's DNA is in that specimen. And if someone really wanted to, they could look at the DNA and quite possibly identify who that is. So there is no such thing as de-identifying a sample if there's DNA in it. And I can't imagine a sample that doesn't have DNA in it if it's coming from someone. And scientists have proven it's possible to re-identify anonymous samples using this DNA I'm mentioning and publicly available information, so it's really not that hard to do. Definitely viable. And many, many important biological advances have been made from these clinical biospecimens, so it's not to um, kind of belittle this, because we would not be where we are in medicine today if it wasn't for these clinical biospecimens. However, is it ethical to use people's own cells without their consent to be making these advances without people knowing what they're doing to their cells? So the Federal Policy for Protection of Human Subjects, also known as the Common Rule, which Rebecca Skloot um, kind of, she refers to this rule as the Common Rule. It governs research on humans, tissues, and genetic material, and the U.S. government has proposed revisions to this that could alter the whole game. So as we know it today, how research is done on samples and the consent with that could really, really change. But that's up to the public. The public really has... Um, could have a big influence and impact on this only if they speak up. And changes could include, quote, content of consent forms for clinical trials, if and how your medical and genetic information can be used, how your privacy will be protected, and more. The most controversial thing would require scientists to get consent for research on all biospecimens, even anonymous ones. And that's a good direct quote from the article. So we have a lot of things that could be changing. And the, the main part that comes down to it is the consent. And it's the consent to use the specimens. It's the consent to how they're going to be used. And if you will be protected as a person that, that, that your whole genome isn't going to be leaked at some point on the internet because that could lead to genetic non-discrimination or sorry, genetic discrimination in your job. Lots of different things can be affected by just having your DNA um, kind of end up in the wrong hands or be exposed. So what's changed? What has prompted this? Why are we looking at revising this? Well, precision medicine is a good contender. So we've talked about this a lot on the show, but precision medicine is also known as personalized medicine. They go by both terms. And basically it's tailoring medical treatments. And the way to make progress on this is to work on massive amounts of human samples. So how does Dr. Francis S. Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health, believe this could work in the f future? Like, how are we actually going to have a future in personalized medicine? How is it actually going to happen? What's the methods behind it? Well, he's thinking by involving donors, which is mutual beneficial because scientists will have more information and the results can be life-changing for the donors. So scientists are getting all of these new samples and way, way more information to be interpreting and looking at and analyzing and comparing. And the uh, partners in research are going to 
have a lot of this feedback, or at least he hopes have a lot of this feedback so that they can gain things in their own personal health. So really, he's looking at it being a very mutual beneficial relationship. Um, he says, quotes, participants will be partners in research, not subjects. And that's really the big difference that Francis Collins is looking at because he's saying that we can be partners in this and not be taking samples from people that they can also benefit from this. And this will be key in the Precision Medicine Initiative, which was announced a year ago in January 2015, which began with a $215 million down payment. And Obama has backed Precision Medicine um, ever since he was a senator. If you really look back at um, different legislations, he's been behind. And this is kind of a, a key moment to kind of pass along um, Precision Medicine and kind of get the ball rolling even more. So the issues of patient consent is using these clinical biospecimens um, have been identified. And the issue is really how do we solve it? We know that um, the consent part is an issue. We've seen that this is a problem. But how do we even begin to solve this massive problem of getting consent for all of these samples? That's going to be a lot, a lot of work. So what Rebecca Sklu calls for is for the public to get involved, to have a say if permission is necessary for research, because maybe you're listening to this and you say, I don't think permission really is necessary. Scientists should be able to just take samples and use them for research. Like, I don't care what they do with my stuff. It's going towards medicine. It may help me. It may help, you know, future generations of mine. And other people might say, no, I, I want to have consent on what my cells are doing. I want to know what they're doing it for. I Maybe you don't want it working on um, certain medical advances that maybe you're, you're ethically against. So there's a lot of opinions out there, and Rebecca Sloot is really calling for the public to voice those opinions. And the public can propose changes through a government website through January 6th. So you don't have a lot of time. You really have to do this now and, and really contemplate these issues and kind of weigh them out in your mind and voice your opinion because this is your chance as the public to do so. The web address is so long I won't read the entire thing on air, but I've put it in the show notes on the website dnapodcast.com and it's available on regulations.gov. And currently the comments um, being posted are from like scientists, research institutions, bioethicists, and industry groups who strongly oppose the new consent requirements. So especially if you are for these consent requirements, you really definitely want to have your voice be heard because the people in the scientific community so far on a general basis, making a huge generalization, which I probably shouldn't, but they seem to be against it as a whole. Now, the public is really not being uh, represented and fight for having control over who can use your cells and what they are using it for um, really is something that is important. And what Skloot has discovered through her career and extensive research is that the public, quote, wants to know if their biospecimens are used in research, and they want to be asked first. That's a direct quote. And that's pretty plain and simple that she has found through her, her long career in just looking at the ethics of this, and she really has devoted her career to this, is that people want to know what their biospecimens are used for and just want to be asked for just to be knowledgeable that, that is happening. That's really the bottom line of what people want. And possibly the scientific community doesn't really quite understand that that is what the general population may be wanting. It's those two things. And that isn't, that isn't too hard to accomplish if you look at um, other things that maybe the scientific community is thinking that people want to um, have accomplished. So what credentials does Sklut have? I keep saying that she's had a long career in this. Um, but I want to read this uh, short um, little piece from her article that really um, kind of sums it up quite nicely. She says, quote, people tell me this because I wrote a book about Henrietta Lacks, a black tobacco farmer whose cancer cells taken without her knowledge in 1951 are still alive in laboratories worldwide. Those cells, codenamed HeLa, were the first such cells grown and one of the most important advances in medicine. But they came with troubling consequences. And this is really important to listen to the consequences. Her children were later used in research. Their medical information was published. And the HeLa genome, including personal information about Miss Lax and potentially her descendants, was sequenced and posted online, all without the family's knowledge. All without the family's knowledge. 
So these are all the consequences that can happen when people are not informed on what's happening. When people are informed, a lot of these issues would not be occurring because they would maybe not really be too involved with the process, but by knowing kind of what's happening, they can prevent things or try and prevent things, have a better chance at preventing them of having this information go public, having genomes go public. Because if your genome goes public, that's giving away your offspring's part of their genome as well. So by the public not knowing this information, it creates a wonder of what else researchers and scientists are doing that the lay people are unaware of. It kind of opens that jar of, if we don't really know about this, what else are they doing? What else are they doing that could be affecting us that we're, we really don't know? So people like Henrietta Lacks' family are proud of their, that their cells have helped the advancement of medicine, of course. But SCLU has found over and over that they wish they were asked for permission and they wish they were clued in on what was happening, just kept in the loop. Like so many other laws that are changing, the laws are presented in dense and confusing language that even experts have a difficulty with, let alone just lay people or college students, people that aren't quite that expert level in the field. And there is a difference in this case. The Department of Health and Human Service has posted a summary that's only about a page long, so it really is digestible, and has several explanatory videos that kind of explain what the current um, common rule is and some of the changes that could occur. And if the revised rule were to go into place... It would, quote, require informed consent for research on all biospecimens, but not all genetic information inside them. So it's kind of a step in the right direction, in my opinion, that we are, if, if this goes into, if the revised rule goes into play, then we are having more informed consent on these research on biospecimens, but we're still not getting all of the informed consent on all genetic information. So in my opinion, it's definitely more of a progress but there's still issues that need to be worked out. And there are also other suggestions on how to combat this issue. And the consent form template would, um, one of them is that the consent form template would require um, a broad consent, meaning it would disclose any potential for commercial profit, whether donors would be compensated. And after giving consent to this broad consent, those samples could be used in research indefinitely and new samples could be collected for 10 years. This would also only apply to future samples, not samples already collected in stores. So it only it doesn't um, grandfather anything in. It's only from when this law goes into effect to the future. And an issue that goes with this is that the administrative end, that means way more paperwork. And some scientists say this could halt new samples from coming and research could be halted. But this has been an issue that scientists have constantly brought up with new laws that could go into effect and that have gone to effect, and it really hasn't changed things. I took a course in um, issues in genetics um, about a year ago, and we looked at the history of it, and a lot of times when scientists were worried that new laws would prevent new research, it really didn't happen. So maybe it would halt some new samples, but I think on the grand scheme of things, it really wouldn't affect things too much. So what do the people revising the common rule want to hear from the public? Because I keep saying voice your opinion, but what do they exactly want to hear? Well, here's what Rebecca Skloot suggests. Quote, should scientists have to ask permission to use all leftover clinical samples? Would you say yes? Is broad general consent enough? So that's what I had just explained there. Or do you want options for more control? Why? Should this apply to both tissues and genetic information, anonymous or not? And what if this slowed scientific progress? So those are the questions that if you're not sure kind of where to start when answering um, to the government forum, try and answer those questions and kind of direct your thoughts to that. So again, you have until January 6th to express your opinions on uh, these new possible changes to the government, and I strongly sh suggest that everyone does because you really can make a difference, and I'm definitely going to be going on there after kind of thinking about these issues a little bit more and expressing my opinion, and I, no matter what stance you do have on this, um, I really suggest that you express your opinion because it kind of is your chance to. It, now in history, we are able to do this a little bit easier than we could, say, 100 years ago. So um, it's great that we're able to do this, and I think people really need to take advantage of that and be able to express your opinion. 
So again, I'll put those, the links I mentioned on the website, including um, the Department of Health and Human Services summary page. That's only like a page long. Um, and they have explanatory videos where you can post uh, your opinions that the government will read. And I'll post the article that Rebecca Sklute wrote that um, kind of sums up all of her thoughts about this and kind of lays certain things out. So that wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. You can tune in next week, Monday at 11.30 a.m. on whus.org or 91.7 FM to learn more about genetics. Um, also, dnapodcast.com has all you need, including the Twitter information, at DNA Podcast or at Kira Deneen if you want to follow me. And the one I like to plug the most, emails, emails, emails. So I love receiving emails um, on what you want me to discuss. If you have something that could contribute to the show in any way, um, if you have questions, comments, any of that, um, info at dnapodcast.com. Again, that's info at dnapodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Join me next week, again, Monday at 1130 a.m. to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.